Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our webinar is going to begin. I'm Steve Love, President and CEO of the DFW Hospital Council. We want to thank you for joining us today. This is an educational webinar. It's hosted in coordination with Hall Renda, who's an associate member of the council, and they're also a year-round sponsor and help with, with many of our events, and we certainly appreciate it. Today's topic is a very timely one, increasing the bottom line through reimbursement appeals, looking at Medicare DISH, and GME payments. And we look forward to this presentation as they have a panel of national experts. And today we're going to cover several topics, including the Medicare DISH inclusion in the 1115 waiver days, the capital DISH for urban to rural reclassed hospitals, and direct graduate medical education payments for fellows. Our speakers today are all experts in the healthcare field. They include Keith Duggar, Doug Hock, Heather Mogden, and Maureen O'Brien Griffin, all of them Hall Runda attorneys with decades of experience. They assist clients across the U.S. to include hospitals, health systems, physicians, physician groups, and they navigate many different operational channels challenges that hospitals face. Keith Duggar has been a previous speaker at the DFW Hospital Council and has hosted educational events. Paul Renda here in Dallas, and they're a nationwide firm, uh, uh, has been headquartered here, and Keith has over 20 years experience with them, and we look forward to their presentation. A final note, if you have any questions, please type them in the question box, all the chat boxes. We're going to monitor those and relay those to the speakers. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Keith Duggar. Welcome, Keith. Great. Thank you, Steve. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Chris, for doing, as always, such a great job of helping uh, put the program together. Um, as always, we appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to present to the DFW Hospital Council membership. I also want to thank everyone out there for joining in today. Um, as a law firm dedicated solely to the healthcare industry, we love being able to share information on current issues and topics with members of the council, especially when we are able to discuss opportunities that could potentially have a positive financial impact on those members. So before we get started, I want to briefly introduce our panel. First, we have Heather Mogden. She'll be discussing resident and fellow waiting for GME programs. Heather is a shareholder in our Milwaukee office and focuses her practice on complex litigation matters and provider appeals. Next, we have Drew Houck, who will discuss the DISH 1115 waiver day issue. Drew is a shareholder in our Indianapolis office, who, like Heather, focuses his practice on complex litigation and provider appeals. Finally, Maureen Griffin will talk about issues affecting urban to rural reclassed hospitals, as well as providing information on other group and individual appeal initiatives ongoing. Maureen is also a shareholder in our Indianapolis office and has over 30 years of experience in Medicare and Medicaid payment and policy matters, including acting as lead counsel on numerous reimbursement appeals and litigation. So again, we thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Heather. Good afternoon. Um, so I'll be talking about the CGME issue. Um, this centers on graduate medical education programs, including residencies and fellowships. Um, but this, if you want to advance to the next slide, um, but this issue primarily affects hospitals that have fellowship programs. Um, this isn't necessarily a new issue, but it does present a new opportunity. Uh, many hospitals have been protesting the way that DGME pro uh, payments have been made for hospitals that are training over their GME uh, FTE cap, and particularly when that overage includes residents that are beyond their initial residency period and fellows. Um, so the DGME payment calculation includes a statutory directive from Congress that CMS is supposed to wait uh, resident FTEs at 1.0 and uh, 
and post residents are post IRP residents and fellows at 0.5. Um, and when hospitals train at or below their cap, the calculation does not present any problems. So it, really this is for hospitals that are training over their cap. When you train over your cap, the way that the old calculation worked is that um, there was this proportional reduction that was applied to different categories of residents so that uh, the total resident FTEs was then, when it was weighted, it was reduced down to the cap so that the payment um, would not exceed what the payments would be if you were training at your cap. And so it's strictly a math problem that when you apply a proportional reduction to an already reduced 0.5 that's applied to those post IRP and fellow um, individuals, then you end up with a weight that is actually below 0.5. So the Hershey case addressed this. That was decided um, only recently. That was in 2021 in the DC District Court. And the court there said that that calculation was improper. So in the 2023 final rule, CMS corrected that payment. And for administrative purposes, they determined that they were going to correct it not just prospectively for 2023 and beyond, but retroactively for all cost report years that were um, open at the time. So that would include uh, any cost report year, according to their review, uh, potentially dating back to 2001. That was the, in the proposed rule, they uh, said that they would be applying this new calculation to open or reopenable cost reports. And so this calculation having been in place since October of 1997, so that would be for fiscal year 1998, they looked all the way back and determined how many fiscal years could this affect. And the open and reopenable cost reports included cost reporting periods dating back to 2001. So by the language of the rule, it applies to all open cost reports dating all the way back to 2001. Um, so there's Sorry, if you could go back. Um, so there's a uh, question about what open cost reports means. And uh, there's that discrepancy between the open and reopenable cost reports in the proposed rule versus the final rule. Um, so we want to challenge this on the basis that an open cost report doesn't only include NPRs that have not been issued, cost reports that have not been audited or settled, but it also includes cost reports that are open for any issue. Um, if any issue is on appeal and being uh, kind of placed on a max desk, then if that cost report is also affected by this, this rule should be applied. Um, and that would also maybe include any specifically any revised NPRs um, that, or NPRs that are being revised right now for a different GME issue that CMS has um, recently addressed. So next slide. We'll talk a little bit more about that. You can see it under the, um, this, so there's three jurisdictional buckets that we'll be addressing. Um, the merits issue is whether the payment was proper and the answer already from Hershey and acknowledged in the 2023 final rule is that it was not. So the question then is how many cost report years that have already been settled under the old calculation can we get in front of the board to be corrected? Um, the ones that are already open, CMS has already said that they're going to apply the new calculation, so we don't really have to worry about those. Um, but what we are worried about then are those that have already been settled. And so that would include any original NPRs that are within that 100 day um, appeal window that for whatever reason did not get settled using this new calculation. Um, after the publication of the final rule, there has been some, I'll call them software delays, where the manner in which CMS can calculate these payments has not been updated for their software. So even after CMS issued the rule and said that the new calculation would be applied, um, its MACs were still issuing NPRs that applied the old rule because that's the software, the cost reporting software that they had in place. 
Um, many of them, I would hope by now most of them have had that corrected, but after the August 10th, 2022 publication of that final rule, we have seen NPRs that have been issued with the old calculations. So that's something that you really need to pay attention to. Um, if you do have an NPR that was issued after August 10th, um, that August 10th date, uh, the 180 day window for, for that is coming up. Um, and that's going to be the basis of our appeal for these past cost report years. So we are appealing the, again, the closed cost report is part of this appeal. Um, but that date also tracks to your NPRs and those can be filed as well. Um, but those will probably be filed as a different group and um, and under sort of different circumstances within whatever your 180 day window is when that NPR is issued. So even if um, we're gonna be talking about a filing deadline soon for joining this group appeal, um, but if you are continuing to get NPRs, we do want you to keep monitoring those and make sure that it is issued using the correct calculation. And if not, then whenever your 180 day window you know, closes, you need to make sure that you filed an appeal for that reimbursement. Um, so this is also going to apply to revised NPRs that are issued as a result of um, CMS's recent correction to the Medicare Advantage GME payments. Um, that was a corollary to the nursing and allied health adjustment that was made. This is um, something that had been corrected in, I believe, 2020. Um, and that was dating all the way back to 2002. So a number of hospitals have cost reports that have been reopened within that three-year reopening period because in order to correct that issue, CMS mandated reopening and then issued these revised NPRs that correct that DGME issue. So even if the original NPR is outside of that three-year reopening period, if, the revise, if you have a revised NPR that was issued with um, a corrected payment for the Medicare Advantage GME payment, um, we would consider you to end those cost report years to fall into this three-year reopening um, bucket as well. So um, we would advise anyone who has cost report years that are affected by the 2023 rule where they are training over their cap, where they have either fellowship programs or you know, a number of residents that are beyond their initial residency period um, to go back and look at whether and which years are affected by this. You can use our protest toolkit to do that. Um, that's something that's available through our website. Anyone can email any of us and, and we'll find a way to get it to you. Um, but for those years that are affected within the three-year reopening period, um, we would advise that you request reopening from the MAC, but we don't expect that they will actually reopen it. Um, they have said in the final rule that this rule is not a basis for reopening, um, but it will at least give us another um, opportunity to say that CMS acted arbitrarily and capriciously and should have done uh, what was asked when they were um, given that request to reopen. Um, so as I kind of just alluded to our argument for why those three-year reopening, um, why the cost reporting years within the three-year reopening period um, should have had this final rule applied to them is because of that Medicare Advantage DGME payment. So CMS, when it made that correction recently, um, they again mandated that all of the affected cost reports within the reopening window be reopened so that this could be corrected. And there's absolutely no justification given at all as to why CMS didn't have the same process in place so that they would mandate reopening for all of the hospitals that were affected by this and make those corrections. Um, the proximity in time and, and the similarity of issue kind of supports the idea that reopening all of them for one and not the other really does not make any sense. And there was no justification again for that given in the final rule. Um, the final jurisdictional bucket is going to be a little bit harder. We don't have that similarity argument as to, you know, CMS did this for reopenable cost report years for the Medicare Advantage issue and they didn't do that here. Um, instead, for fully closed cost reports, we do plan to appeal all the way back to fiscal year 1998. 
um, all the way through the, the present, whatever is the latest settled cost report that you have. Um, and what we're going to rely on then is an argument that CMS should have finalized uh, a rule that provides a complete reopening and full retroactive application of this rule. And our basis for that is actually CMS's attempt to do exactly that in the proposed rule that it issued for dish payments after Alina. Um, that has been, I guess it's a, a subject of budding litigation after all of the litigation that led to Alina that uh, Maureen's gonna be talking about a little bit later. Um, but it is at least, it gives us a foothold as to why, um, why there would be some legal basis to be able to do that. And it is very possible that this issue will kind of follow on the coattails of that for, God, I hope not a decade. Um, but that, that seems to be in, in some of these cases how CMS appeals uh, tend to move along. Um, next slide. So if, um, if you want to know whether you are affected by this and whether you were training over your cap, where your cap was at, um, you can obviously look to your cost report, but then in terms of getting actual supporting documentation to prove to CMS that you did have those residents, those numbers were accurate on your cost report, what we would be looking for um, to provide as evidence for any kind of negotiation with CMS, which is our you know, plan A, or any kind of litigation that we need to get into, um, it would probably be those IRIS reports that might have been sent. Uh, they need to be in a readable format. Um, I know that back when this rule was first in place in the late 90s and early 2000s, it's most probable that those IRIS reports were submitted in a format that is no longer readable by modern computer software. It's not a PDF that you can print out or, or any kind of program that you can read. Um, so if that is what you were relying on, um, it would have to be in a readable format. And you, to the extent that you don't have access, it is possible that the MAC might have kept something like that. Uh, we, it, we don't know, and it'll depend on the MAC and their own record keeping uh, practices. And most likely, though, that information, as far as the raw information that would have been fed into an IRIS report, would be found in your hospital's medical education office. Um, and that would give you any of the information specific to fellowship programs um, and who was the accrediting body. So um, CMS, we've had a, a number of questions from clients about certain fellowships that they just never included on their cost report. And one reason that you might find that, if that's the case for your hospital, um, is that only ACGME accredited programs are actually allowed to be included on the cost report. There are other fellowship accrediting programs, um, and for whatever reason, CMS does not recognize those. So you will have to make sure that whatever fellowship program you have um, that is bringing you over the cap and kind of making it so that you're affected by this issue, that those programs are recognized uh, for your cost reporting. So our group appeal, as um, kind of mentioned, will cover from 1998 when the rule was first in place all the way through technically 2023. Uh, because we will be appealing from not any particular NPR so much as the final rule itself. Um, and then we will have to identify, though, in terms of any kind of amount in controversy for the appeal, what viable claims you actually have for any given cost report year and the amount in controversy for um, those years in total. Next slide. If you are interested, there's a link at the end of this presentation when you get a copy of the PDF. Hopefully that link will be live um, in the document so that you can access these. We do have the election to participate form. Um, it just asks for contact information for your hospital. And then we, one of the ways that you can identify which years to include on that uh, is using our protest toolkit and then a designation of representative letter and the engagement agreement. So for this group appeal, like many of our others, um, if you are interested in joining, the fees for this will be divided proportionally among um, all of the participants based on the total amount in controversy. So um, if you are you know, a hospital where you've got the most skin in the game, you'll pay 
the largest portion of the fees. If you have comparatively less skin in the game, your portion of the fees will be less. And then the way that that's determined is based on 80% um, of our standard rates, and there's a 10% success fee tied on to that. Next slide. All right, well, I guess that was all I had. So, um, Drew, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks, Heather. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm gonna give a quick overview here of uh, a smaller issue because I, I don't want to provide a short amount of time for Mo. I know she's got a couple more big, bigger issues that may impact some more of the participants on this call. So I'll, I'll run through this quickly, but do stop me if you have any questions. We're gonna be talking about um, the section 1115 waiver days and how they impact the um, dish adjustments for hospitals in Texas and what's going on with um, the, the impact of litigation in that space for uh, other hospitals uh, as it might bleed over into Texas's program with the Texas Healthcare and Quality Improvement Program. Um, so, so really I'll lead with the ending here, which is why does this matter? Why is anybody fighting about it, right? Well, as you know, some states have some Section 1115 waiver programs in which they've entered into agreements. The states have entered into agreements with the federal government to expand coverage to what would traditionally be Medicaid services and to increase the coverage for the federal government to make some payments towards those services for traditionally uninsured or underinsured patients who would not otherwise have been eligible for Medicaid um, benefits. Why is that important? It's important because the fight has developed um, on the well-litigated uh, dish fraction as to where do these days go? If you're a hospital who's participating in the 1115 waiver day program, um, how do you calculate those days? How do you keep track of them? And can you put them in the dish fraction? And if you can, you get to count them as Medicaid days in your DISH fraction so that they go into your Medicaid numerator um, and therefore increase your Medicare reimbursement under the, the DISH fraction adjustment that you might be receiving. Um, that's why it's important. And it's important because the answer that has started to uh, crystallize in other states that have litigated, hospitals in other states that have litigated this through the federal court system is yes, you probably do, because the statute says that you get to, the secretary has said that you get to in regulations and CMS kind of changing their mind mid game because they don't want to make that recognition isn't going to play. So that's the that's the ending here. And I'll get you to how we got there as quickly as I can. So what are the 1115 waiver day programs, right? These are the demonstration programs that allow the secretary of HHS to enter into those uh, demonstration projects to expand coverage and hopefully find some ways to provide some expanded coverage um, for some cost efficient uh, ways and, and some innovative ways in states. And states create their program and enter into a pre-approved uh, demonstration project with the Secretary of HHS. They're provided for by statute in which Congress said that these programs would be um, including services for beneficiaries that would be deemed eligible under Medicaid. and the implementing regulations, importantly, that were in, implemented by the secretary also said that participants in these programs who are receiving inpatient services would be deemed eligible under Medicaid. And that's going to become really critical to where the litigation fell out on this. Um, as I said, when trying to figure out where to add these patient days uh, into the dish fraction or whether to add these patient days into the dish fraction, um, there were two clear lines. Providers said, we think that they're Medicaid days and they go into the Medicaid numerator of the dish fraction. And CMS, of course, said, no, they're not Medicaid days because these are not Medicaid beneficiaries. They're just beneficiaries who are receiving, uh, you know, pro or reimbursement under a demonstration project who were deeming to be Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, so why did any of that matter? Well, there had been some litigation around this on some smaller programs. Um, even some here in the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Fifth Circuit, which covers Texas. But what really kind of came to pass was there was a program out of Florida, a low income pool program that was taken up to the DC District Court and then finally the DC Circuit Court, as much of the Medicare reimbursement litigation does. Um, and that was impactful because decisions out of that uh, circuit uh, not only impact the court, the hospital and the state that's involved, but really impact the agency and bind the agency's hands on the interpretations of law that are involved there too. Um, what happened was in Bethesda, 
Um, the hospitals had a very similar program to the kind of program that's in place in Texas, and they took it up to the D.C. courts, the federal courts in D.C., and said uh, after appealing these or placing these days on their cost report and getting them disallowed by the MAC and disapproved of by the board, um, they said to the D.C. District Court, look, Your Honor, the, the Congress was very clear in the statute. It said that these days are Medicaid days because Medicaid days include any days that are deemed uh, Medicaid days by the secretary. And that specifically includes days deemed Medicaid days under an 1115 waiver day program. And his implementing regulations use the exact same language. They place no qualifications on it about the details of the program that's in place at the state level. And they have no um, tie to the specific benefits benefits that are provided. It's if the person is eligible for those services, they can be counted as a Medicaid day. And it was a very persuasive argument to the judges in DC. Um, initially at the district court level, the hospitals were successful. Um, and they said the language is what the language is. You don't have any deference to the agency on this, um, which for those who are used to the litigation in this space is a good sign for providers from a court. And when CMS appealed that ruling to the circuit court in D.C., the D.C. circuit, and what's kind of an unusual, uh, <laughs> an unusual play uh, in federal court litiga litigation, uh, the D.C. circuit didn't actually really write a full-throated opinion. It said the D.C. district court's opinion was so good, just go read it, um, and, and said, no, CMS, you got this wrong. The statute says what it says. The regulations that you wrote say what they say. And any body that's participating in an 1115 waiver day program that you approved, secretary, um, gets to be counted as a Medicaid eligible patient for purposes of the dish fraction. Um, and so that decision came down in 2020. It was not taken up to the Supreme Court and it remains good law. And we think binding case law on the agency. Um, why is that important for Texas? Well, Texas has a very similar program. It doesn't have all of the necessary details are not the same as the, um, the LIP program down in Florida, but what, one of the most important pieces coming out of the litigation on this is that the details don't really matter. Um, the secretary can't point to specific details of the program and say that that saves them from being Medicaid eligible days because that's not what the statute or the regulations are at all about. They make no mention of the details of the program. They just say if it's an approved program, the days count. And so Texas having a similar program, hospitals that are participating in that program who have inpatient services or excuse me, who are participating in that program, who have patients that are eligible for potential Medicaid inpatient services, get to count those days towards their Medicaid fraction. Importantly, there's some language, I believe, out of the uh, Fifth Circuit here in, in Texas that said that when they were looking at it, they reminded the secretary that uh, once he authorizes a demonstration project, there are no take backs. He doesn't get to change his mind in the middle of this or when the cost reports come out and there's more money owed back to a hospital for providing extended, expanded coverage under a demonstration program. That's the way it is until a new rule or a new statute comes out. Um, so we think the rationale of Bethesda and the Fifth Circuit are strongly uh, persuasive here uh, in the case of Texas's program. The decision or the question kind of then arises, so what? We have a really beneficial decision out of D.C. Uh, we're here in Texas. What does that mean for hospitals today? Is it binding on the board? If you put these days into your cost reports, you get them disallowed by the MAC and you end up in front of the PRRB, what does that mean? The board can be fickle sometimes on this. Technically, the board is legally bound by decisions coming out of either the D.C. Circuit or the circuit court and the courts of the district in which the hospital sit. So, yes, it is legally bound by that. However, it is ultimately beholden to decisions from CMS and the CMS administrator. So if the CMS administrator does not agree with the decision or has not applied the decision that has come out of the courts, there can be some ongoing litigation as we've certainly seen in other dish litigation. Um, so right now, though, we think that there's a good chance that CMS is making some movement and some progress on this and that hospitals um, could successfully count these days uh, in their cost reports. So these are our recommendations. While Initially last year, CMS had proposed a rule that was going to reverse course on its regulatory language to try to clarify that some of these days would not be Medicaid eligible days. 
uh, it got a lot of feedback from interested uh, commenters, and it, it stopped the presses on the proposed rule that did not go to finalization. We've not heard yet what's going to happen with uh, any rulemaking in 2023, but um, as a caveat, we, we have a sense uh, from our discussions with CMS, uh, we do believe that providers should be basically staking their claim to these days, that there may be some sort of movement from CMS in the next year. Um, and they want to be sure that if you have 1115 um, waiver days that you can put into an open cost report or be claiming on your cost reports or protesting that you should be doing that. Um, because if the day comes that CMS issues some sort of guidance or some sort of ruling and is open to making a settlement with hospitals in Texas, you want to be sure that you've made clear to the agency before they make that decision uh, that you felt that these days were days that you were owed money under. Um, otherwise, as has been past practice with the agency, they're not as inclined to settle with hospitals who decide that they're owed money. Um, after they've announced a willingness to, to count days or after they've announced willingness and openness to a settlement. So our recommendations here, if you have future cost reports, do include uh, your 1115 waiver days on those cost reports. If you have current open cost reports that you're working on and you can amend those to include the 1115 waiver days, consider doing so. And for eligible hospitals, if you're receiving NPRs um, that have those that have been disallowed, we're recommending that providers appeal those determinations within 180 days. Um, that's all, and I'm gonna hand it off to Mo here to talk about several other issues that we have. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Glad to be here. Hey, and Maureen. Yes. Hold on for one second, please. Maureen, yes. this is Steve. I do apologize for interrupting, but I thought it was kind of timely. If Drew doesn't mind, we just got a question. It says, Drew, do you recommend this for providers from all states, or are you recommending this for just Texas related to those uh, 11, 15 days? It's a really good question, and it I'm going to give the worst answer that anybody can ever get from a, a lawyer, and it's it depends. And that's because these 1115 waiver day programs are very particular in how they're crafted. And so Texas happens to have a waiver day program that's crafted similar to I believe, the Florida program and similar to, I believe it was Mississippi and Massachusetts that had had the, the details that work out here to where they're inpatient services in these pool programs. So the, the question would really depend on what other state we're, we're discussing. There are some others. I know, for example, Tennessee has a similar program that might be susceptible to the ruling out of the Bethesda case. However, there, there are other states like, in, I'm in Indiana, for example, Indiana's program is not susceptible to a challenge for reasons we didn't get into today. So it's not across the board, all 11, 15 waiver day programs. It's specific programs that have these kind of larger pools. And we'd be happy to answer questions specifically if somebody wants to reach out to us about their particular state and the particular 11, 15 waiver program with, within that. And yeah, thanks, for answering, thanks for answering that. And I will tell you, we're getting great feedback. People are raising their hands, but please put your questions either in the question box or the chat box because we don't want to interrupt uh, Maureen in her next presentation, but we'll certainly ask the questions if you put them in the question box. I'm sorry, Maureen, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, not a problem at all. I'm glad that you asked that question. And I will just tack on to what Drew said with respect to that. Um, in our current group appeal on this, we have a number of Texas hospitals already in there, as well as hospitals in Tennessee, because Tennessee's program is similar. So that's good in the respect that it helps with the cost sharing. Um, we also, there's hospitals in a few other states that are looking at this issue. So there are seven states in total that kind of fit this mold and the additional ones besides Texas and Tennessee are Florida, of course, um, and California, Massachusetts, Drew did mention that one, and Kansas, I believe it is, and it's either Arizona or New Mexico. Um, it's New Mexico, yeah, I'd have to, okay. I'd have to check that, yeah. Yes, yes, it is New Mexico. So um, just wanted to add that piece. I'm going to talk about capital dish for hospitals that have reclassed from urban to rural status. And I did want to say I was 
one, glad to see so many people signed up for this and glad to see a few familiar names out there. So hi to everybody. Um, okay, on the capital dish issue, hospitals are able to reclass, or urban hospitals are able to reclassify to rural status for purposes of obtaining either a higher Medicare wage index or usually um, the, the, the biggest reason why hospitals do that is to obtain favorable 340B drug pricing. Um, and there are some other benefits for doing that as well. When hospitals do that, they unfortunately under Medicare's regulations lose their capital dish payments. And so um, some hospitals in Ohio took them to bat, took CMS to bat on that. And in the Toledo Hospital case decided last year, um, CMS lost on that issue at the DC district court level. Um, the court took a look at CMS's regulatory scheme and where CMS tried to specifically exclude hospitals um, qualification for capital dish and determined that was not appropriate. And CMS, while they initially appealed that to the Court of Appeals in DC, they later withdrew that appeal. And um, we've not heard anything more from CMS on that issue uh, since then. So go ahead, next slide, Drew. So we have been filing appeals on this issue. We already have um, a pretty good sized number of hospitals in our group appeal on this. We started filing last year and we are filing from hospitals final determinations, which, is, which are your NPRs, your notices of program reimbursement that you all get after your cost reports are settled. Um, and you have a 180 day window to file those appeals from the, we always uh, recommend using from the date on the NPR, um, but the regulations actually are from the date of receipt of your final determination and CMS, the, the board rules add a five day window in there just for anybody who might be close to that deadline. Um, like I said earlier, we have not heard anything from CMS. They've not taken any action to correct that issue prospectively like we saw them do with the graduate medical education payment issue. Um, we think that it kind of signals that the fact that CMS withdrew their appeal, they felt like they didn't have a strong issue there. Um, they didn't want the DC Court of Appeals having uh, issuing a favorable decision against them, which is then kind of the law of the land, right? Um, and so they wanted to keep it on the down low, just, you know, at that, at, based on the litigation, it only applies to Toledo Hospital and anyone else who was in that litigation. Um, we are recommending, based on the outcome of that Toledo Hospital case, that hospitals should include those capital dish costs in your cost reports when you submit them. I don't know if the software allows you to do that. Um, and that's something you can follow up with us and let us know about. Um, but if if not, then it absolutely you should, you would want to file that, include that issue as a protest item. And our protest toolkit that Heather mentioned earlier, which there's a link to it at the end of uh, these slides here, gives you a calculation to be able to do that. But if you are able to include those costs in your submitted cost report, we'd recommend that you include a cover letter indicating that you're doing so pursuant to the Toledo Hospital case. And we can provide you a sample language for that if you need to. Go ahead, Drew, you can advance. We've recommended that same approach with, as Drew mentioned earlier, with respect to including the 1115 waiver uh, costs in your submitted cost reports. Oh, and I did, I wanted to add one thing um, in follow-up to that when Drew was talking about that. We, 
CMS has instructed the MACs in these states, like in, in your state, Texas, to allow those days to be counted as Medicaid eligible days if they've been included in the cost report. Um, also, initially, Novitas, your MAC there in Texas, last year was not allowing hospitals to amend their cost reports to include those costs if your cost report, if those reports weren't closed yet. But at some point um, in the latter half of last year, we had heard from a number of uh, hospitals and consulting firms that they were allowing that. So um, let us know if you attempt to amend to include those days and you, you, it's rejected. Um, all right, back to capital dish payment. Um, so we're recommending obviously filing appeals within that 180 day window. We are also recommending the same thing, amending your cost reports to include the capital dish costs for any cost reports that are open. Um, I don't think at, at this point, the MACs are gonna allow you to amend your cost reports, but you know, we, we shall see. Let us know what you find out. Um, and uh, that you, we would say you definitely want to appeal that when it gets, when your cost report gets settled. If you have previously protested this issue when you filed your cost report, you shouldn't need to obviously amend, um, but that preserves your ability to appeal it and have a strong appeal uh, once you do file an appeal. Um, again, use our protest toolkit to calculate those amounts and include the, that for any you know, cost reports that you still need to that you're still going to be submitting, um, like uh, the you know June for the calendar year and hospitals. The legal fees in this appeal are the same as what Heather explained for the um, graduate medical education appeal, and that is our typical uh, our typical fee arrangement. In with these group appeals, and it works really well, especially with the the way we have we do the cost sharing, so that um, hospitals, the smaller hospitals, are able to participate um, along with the hospitals who stand to gain quite a bit, considerably more, uh, in these appeals. All right, next slide, Drew. Then you can go ahead and. Um, advance to the next one. So um, please, uh, I know I covered that kind of fast, let us know uh, any follow-up questions either in the chat or if we're not able to get through everything, um, we are happy to take by email any questions. So I wanted to just talk real quick about a couple of our main, main Medicare DISH appeals. Um, the one that probably is the biggest by far um, because it probably potentially has the most dollars involved is the SSI dual eligible day appeal issue. And the lead case in that is Advocate Christ. That is our case. Um, it um, is currently at the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. The main issue there is we assert that CMS is undercounting the SSI days because they only include three payment status codes um, for purposes of when they do the match of the SSI days to hospitals Medicare days. And CMS's basis for that or their reasoning is that there are only three PSC codes, payment status codes that signify patients are receiving their SSI payment while they're in the hospital. So the key for CMS is they have to be receiving their SSI payment while they're in the hospital. And that's because CMS interprets the term entitled in the Medicare Dispatch statute as not requiring payment for entitled to Medicare benefits, but the exact opposite, requiring payment for purposes of an, what entitlement to SSI benefits means. And that issue was just very recently decided by the Supreme Court in the Empire case, which I'm sure some of you have certainly heard about. And CMS won. The 
the Supreme Court sided with CMS's interpretation there um, and uh, agreed that entitlement to Medicare was not dependent on payment for purposes of Medicare benefits. They did not address in any way what entitlement to SSI benefits means. And that is the question now to be answered in the advocate price case. So we are, we are, oh, before I go to that, um, I just wanted to give a few examples of what we are raising and have presented previously, um, both at the, the PRB, the Provider Reimbursement Review Board, when we had our hearings uh, on this issue, and then in our briefing at the district court, and now in our briefing at the Court of Appeals. There, there's a couple different buckets or categories of days here, um, and some are stronger than others. There are a number of days where it's pretty clear that the payment status code assigned to these SSI patients signifies entitlement. One is um, there's a PSC code for someone who um, has the change, is their address is changing. Um, so the Social Security Administration doesn't know where to send their paycheck because uh, they, um, the patient or their family has notified them that they're, they're moving. So they hold it. They hold their payment they were supposed to receive while they were in the hospital. Same with if the patient is changing their representative payee. A lot of SSI beneficiaries have their paycheck go to somebody else, their representative payee. Um, and so that often can change and is in flux. And so their check is held. Nursing home days is another great example. When someone is in a nursing home, their SSI benefit is reduced to $30 a month. If they have any income at whatsoever over that 30 day, $30. If I said 30 days a month, I meant $30. Um, and so often they lose their SSI paycheck. But the minute they are discharged from the nursing home or transferred out of the nursing home into your hospital, that is no longer the case. They clearly meet the um, entitlement criteria to SSI. It's just that the Social Security Administration could never act quick enough to get their payment status code changed. So those days aren't being counted. And there's some other good examples that fall into that category. And then another larger category where there's even more days are um, days where, so CMS, they have argued, kind of put all their eggs in one basket saying, SSI benefits in the DISH statute means only payment benefits, someone who gets an SSI paycheck. But there are numerous other references in um, the, in Title 16, the SSI statute that talks about other SSI benefits. Um, SSI beneficiaries are entitled to vocational rehab training and other job training benefits. And the biggest one by far is in many instances, SSI beneficiaries continue to qualify for Medicaid coverage, even when they exceed the SSI income or resource levels. Um, and that is all spelled out in the uh, Title 16, the SSI statute. So we feel those arguments are, are pretty strong support um, to prove CMS wrong. Um, you can go ahead and advance, Drew. So just to close up on the um, SSI dual eligible day issue, we will be closing out briefing soon this month on that and then we feel pretty sure it will be set for oral argument sometime this year, and, and then we'll be awaiting a decision. But in the meantime, hospitals can appeal that issue if you have not previously for uh, any NPRs um, that you have come due. Again, that would be an issue that I don't think your MAC would allow you to amend your cost report to include, um, but you can certainly give it a try. And we would definitely recommend appealing even if you didn't protest that issue. We have that issue with a lot of our hospitals and the protest issue is 
probably heading towards litigation, um, but uh, we think we will be able to overcome that. I wanna make sure we allow enough time for questions, so I'm gonna buzz through the data match issue. Um, I think most people are familiar with what that is. It stems from the base eight case. There's still issues that we believe CMS has not corrected after they revised and corrected their data match process. And hospitals in Pomona tried to obtain that data. Um, CMS has never allowed, never given that out to anybody, the full set of SSI days data. And they received a favorable decision at the district court. It was argued last year and is awaiting decision at the DC Court of Appeals. Um, I will end there and we will open it up um, for questions. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, and thanks to all of you. Great presentations. Just to remind people, if you have questions, please type them in the question or the chat box. We do have a couple, and I'm just going to throw the question out and I'll let each of you determine who's going to answer it. Our hospital currently has open cost reports back to fiscal year 2019, and the audit is not completed. We do not have an NPR. Will they be part of the appeal? Assuming that this one is um, about the DGME issue, no, those ones would not be part of the appeal. Um, if it is still open, again, as I mentioned, that um, is something that we would expect to be corrected once the NPR is issued. Um, but if it is not, then you should definitely uh, file an appeal on that issue. And along those same lines, for the DGME appeal, for hospitals within the three-year reopening window, does Hall Renda have any suggested language for the reopening request? Um, we don't. We actually have gotten this question uh, from a number of people. We originally had asked that anyone wishing to join this appeal, we had a little bit more of a, a public um, webinar about what this is about. Um, we asked that anybody join by, uh, I think it was January 9th. Um, so if anyone is interested in joining the appeal, um, I realized I don't think my slides included the deadline, um, but we have to have it filed um, by February 6th. So if you want to enroll, we do need enrollment documents as quickly as you possibly can so that we can make sure that we have everything in order. We've calculated all the amounts and controversies so that we can include you um, in the group by that filing deadline. Um, in terms of asking for reopening for those uh, cost report years that are within that three-year window, um, you can do that at any time. You don't have to do that before joining the appeal. And we do not have any special magic language that we would recommend anyone including. Um, but when you do request reopening, just make sure that you make it clear that you are requesting reopening for your um, GME payment to be corrected in accordance with that 2023 final rule. Um, any citation to that should be sufficient. But if right. you if, if you need help with that, um, just let us know and we can help you craft a letter. Um, that's not a problem. Here's another question. If a reopening request is denied by the MAC, can it be appealed? Heather, I'll go ahead and jump in on that. Um, unfortunately, the answer to that is no. There is no right appeal rights by under regulation um, anywhere else. But that's a qualified no because if there's other circumstances surrounding that, like our bases that we've set, spelled out um, with respect to the graduate medical education appeal issue. Um, we feel that you know that that's something we will reference that the hospital is attempted to go to exhaust their administrative rights and go through the process of asking it to be reopened. So um, we want you to let us know when you get that denied denial of the reopening request. And Heather, this is kind of I guess a follow up after you talked. I know you touched on this. But what are deadlines to join any of the group appeals? 
and they listed DGME Capital Dish or 1115 waiver? Um, for the DGME, again, we would ask that it be submitted as, as soon as possible, hopefully no later than, I would say, next Thursday, um, the 26th. That would give us enough time to process those documents and have any needed follow-up conversations, but um, it, quicker than that would be preferred. <laughs> And then I'll let uh, yeah. I guess Maureen talk about yeah Capital Dish. So for Capital Dish as well as 1115 waiver days, those appeals we are just filing from hospitals and PRs. So it's 180 you know within that 180 day window uh, of your NPR. I will add or I just want to uh, say that with respect to because it's such a tight deadline on the DGME appeal. Um, the absolute minimum that we have to have to file an appeal is the letter of representation, which is included as one of the documents at the end um, here. And uh, we've worked with a lot of hospitals. Uh, we know that it can take some time. Sometimes with engagement letters, they have to go through legal. That's something that we, if you tell us your intent is to join the appeal, we will file the appeal for you and we can get those as long as we can get that wrapped up pretty quickly. So I just wanted to put that out there for y'all. Great, great information. Another question, um, we're gonna be filing our FY 930-22 cost report in February of 2023, next month. Should we protest the DGME amount if the cost report does not have it calculated correctly. I I would say yes. You um, it doesn't hurt to protest it if whatever cost report software you're using um, does not calculate that appropriately for how you're submitting it. Um, but at the same time, no matter how it is submitted, CMS is obligated to apply the correct calculation. Um, so hopefully it won't be necessary. It's a, it's a good precaution. Um, and then I, I guess I'll take the opportunity to ha insert a plug for our protest toolkit. Um, we do have that available to anyone at all. It includes not only the GME issue, but um, Capital Dish, Dish SSI, um, and Maureen knows better than me that there's a, you know, a handful of other issues as well. And it will uh, provide language that you can use, protest language that you can include when you can submit your cost report so that it sets up that opportunity to then file an appeal if anything is not uh, calculated favorably for you. And it also, the toolkit also provides you the calculation um, because you need both. You need to include the language, um, the basis of your protest and the calculation on what your uh, estimated impact would be. So yes, basically any group appeal issue out there should be in our protest toolkit. And if there's one that's not, let us know. We'll get it in there. Thank you. Chris is checking the chat box and question box. Chris, are there any other pending questions? I believe that's all. Okay. Um, I don't think we have any outstanding questions now from the chat or the uh, question box. But Maureen, I heard you did say earlier if people think of questions later, they can email you uh, and be glad to answer those. Well, this has been a wealth of information. It's been great. We really appreciate it. And I'll turn it back over to Keith or to Maureen or Heather or Drew for any closing comments. But thank you for a really great webinar. Our pleasure. Keith, you're on mute. I'll just go ahead and close out because I think is that, Keith is, is having... that okay? Oh, there you are. Yeah, we can hear you now, Keith. Sorry about that. For some reason, it got turned off, and I apologize about that. Um, I wanted to thank Maureen, Heather, and Drew. Really appreciate all the information you have, and I want to just let, give you all a second if you want to have any closing comments. Um, out there, but we do again really appreciate those who joined in today. Um, 
it, it, it's it's just it's really fun to be able to provide information and uh, uh, get you some of that timely information that may again help you uh, positively at, uh, on your financial impact. So, so thank you, and Maureen, Heather, Drew, feel free to jump in. The only additional closing comment uh, I'll make is that if there are um, hot topic issues, to issues of the day that you're concerned about or you have questions about, feel free to let us know, Keith there in our Dallas office, but also Steve um, and your organization, we'd be happy to put another webinar on um, at uh, some point um, to, to cover you know, other issues that are of concern or effect to you. Excellent. We, we would welcome that. Well, on behalf of all the people that participated on this webinar, we thank you for a great presentation. We love the answers you gave, and we will certainly stay in touch and hope each and every one of you uh, have a good weekend. So we're going to conclude this at this time. Thank you.